to wrap up everything that we talked about in general chemistry one, I want to go back to an idea that we talked about halfway through the beginning, halfway through this course. And that was the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So remember that we use the kinetic molecular theory to explain the behavior of gases in terms of the constant random motion of molecules. And that part of this is said, uh, part of the kinetic molecular theory said that there were no interactions between gas molecules. Well, what about liquids and solids where there are. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the for this last video in Gen Chem 1. What about uh, what about liquids and solids? How do those atoms and how do those molecules interact with each other? So liquids and solids are completely different. The molecules do not have empty space and they're going to interact with each other. And so the molecules are held together through several interactions, and we're going to talk about these inter interactions a little bit later. Okay, so at the very beginning of the semester, we talked about phases, and just so we're on the same page, okay, let's talk about phases. So phases is hom a homogeneous part of the system that's in contact with other parts of the system. But separated by a well-defined boundary. Okay, and so I have a table over here that explains the difference uh, between solids, liquids, and gases. Gases assume the volume and the shape of the container. They have low density. They're going to be very compressible. And the molecules have free, free motion, they're free range. Liquids have a definite volume, but assume the shape of its container. They're, they're going to have relatively high densities. They're going to be slightly compressible. And molecules, they can slide past one another freely, but they don't have free range. Solids have a definite volume, definite shape. They're going to have high density. And solids are virtually incompressible. And uh, for range of motions, solids will vibrate about a fixed position, but they will not roam. Okay. So that being said, now let's talk about how, how molecules interact with each other. And these are called intermolecular forces. Okay. So intermolecular forces, in other words... What we're looking at are how molecules behave. And these are also called attractive forces. Okay, so intermolecular forces are responsible for the non-ideal behavior of gases. That uh, We talked about this uh, back in when we were talking about the gases back in Chapter 5 that are that let's say if you have a sodium ion that's charged and a chloride ion that's also negatively charged, we know that they're going to come together and they're going to form sodium chloride. We know that. We talked about that when we formed ionic compounds. According to connect molecular theory, sodium ion and the chloride ion are just going to bounce off of each other. But we know that they have to come together and form that compound or form that attraction. Okay, so... Intermolecular forces are responsible for the non-ideal behavior of gases. They're also responsible for the bulk properties of matter, like melting points, boiling points, density, stuff like that. So you have intermolecular forces, which are attractive forces, and this is pretty much how molecules behave with each other. You also have intramolecular forces. All right, so you have intermolecular forces, you have intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces, these are, in other words, what we're looking at are what are the forces that holds atoms together in a molecule? Atoms together in a molecule.
Okay. So that's the question that we ask. What are the mole oops, wrong place. What are the forces that holds the atoms together in a molecule? Well, we got an answer to that. We know that one. To answer that question, that's chemical bonding. That's chemical bonding. That's the ionic bond. That's the covalent bond. We know that those are the forces that hold atoms together. So they stabilize individual molecules. Okay. Now, that being said, when we're comparing numbers of inter and intramolecular forces, intermolecular forces are much weaker than intramolecular forces because the intramolecular forces, that's the energy that we need to break bonds. Okay, intermolecular forces, these are the attraction forces between molecules themselves. So they're going to be much, much, much weaker. Okay, there are four major types of intermolecular forces. So there are dipole, dipole interactions. Okay, and then you're going to have ion dipole interactions. And then finally, London dispersion. Now, dipole-dipole, ion-dipole, and London dispersion, these were known back in the day as van der Waals forces. So if you read some old, uh, some older textbooks, uh, chem, gen chem textbooks from like from the 80s, early 90s, you may see the textbooks are going to refer to, you know, these three that we're going to talk about as Van der Waals forces. Especially, and then you may see organic chemistry texts also refer to these as well. Keep in mind that Van der Waals forces are made up of these three, three forces, dipole, dipole, ion, dipole, excuse me, and London dispersion. Now the other... Other uh, intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. Okay. Now, hydrogen bonding is actually a special case of dipole-dipole interactions. So uh, even though it's it's pretty much the same thing, I'm going to cover this separately. So there are so if we're going to rank intermolecular forces, okay, uh, you've got dipole-dipole, ion dipole, and London dispersion. The, if we were to rank this as strongest to weakest, it would go like this, okay? So the strongest is going to be on top, weakest on the bottom. Now, London dispersion are going to be the weakest forces. At the top is going to be hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force, followed by dipole-dipole, followed by ion-dipole, and then London dispersion are the weakest. Okay, so what we're going to do next is cover each of these individual forces or in individual intermolecular forces, and then we'll talk about this as a whole. All right, so the first intermolecular force that we're going to talk about is called dipole dipole interactions. And these are attract attractive forces between polar molecules. Okay. So in other words, we're looking at molecules that have dipole moments. So if you guys remember, when we first talked about molecules that can have a dipole moment, the example I used this was a couple chapters ago, was HF. And if we look at the electrons in that bond, we know that fluorine is the most electronegative element, so the electrons tend to go from the hydrogen to the fluorine. So we say that the hydrogen is going to be have a carry a, posh, a partially positive charge. Fluorine, because it's elect, very electronegative, it's going to carry a partially negative charge. And so because of this, because you have the electrons in this bond that are going to be sliding towards that fluorine, we say that that creates a dipole moment. And so this arrow, this funky arrow with a plus sign on the, on the left-hand side pointing to the fluorine, pointing to the electronegative atom, 
this is this is what how we represent a dipole moment. So what I'm talking about is that you've got a difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that creates a dipole moment. And how so in other words, when we're looking at dipole dipole interactions, how do these molecules, how do these polar molecules that are they have these polar covalent bonds, how do they interact with each other? So what if uh, you know, what if we had like another set of, of molecules? So what if you had like another HF? Okay. How would this molecule interact with the first molecule? And so what's really cool about dipole-dipole interactions is that they interact just like bar magnets. So what if you had a bunch of these? Okay. So what I'm going to do is let's say... Let's say that you know uh, for this first one, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna use this picture in the corner. Uh, I'm gonna start with the upper left hand corner, and I'm gonna where the plus sign is, I'm gonna put H, and where the minus sign is, I'm gonna put an F. So we're gonna treat this bar magnet as if it's a HF molecule. Okay. So if the hydrogen is on the left hand side, the the molecule that's gonna be right underneath it, it's gonna have the F pointed the other way, and hydrogen running underneath that. So it's actually kind of cool that they're setting up. Now, if I go to the original molecule and go over to the right, I'm going to write it as H and F. Okay, and if I go right underneath that to the center bar magnet, you've got an H right next to the right next to the minus sign. You've got an H on top, so the F goes right underneath. So it's actually kind of cool. They, they start ending up situating themselves just like bar magnets. It's, it, this is the way cool one. So it turns out that the larger the dipole moment, the greater the force, and this is a direct consequence of Coulomb's law. Next interaction that we're going to look at is ion dipole interaction. All right, so ion-dipole interactions, these are attractive forces between an ion and an ion could be positively or negatively charged and a polar molecule. Okay, and the strength of this interaction depends on the size and charge of the ion, and also the magnitude of the dipole. Okay, so uh, I've got a picture here that's going to explain this a little bit. So back, back, way back in chapter four, when we were talking about making an aqueous solution, we talked about the process of hydrolyzing an ionic solid, that if you take sodium chloride, put it in water, the, the sodium and the chloride will break apart from each other and that the sodium ions and the chloride, uh, chloride ions will be uh, hydrated. And so I shown a similar picture that let's say you had, this is your sodium ion, right? And so the sodium ion is going to be surrounded by all these water molecules, by six water molecules, four on either side, and then one on the top and one on the bottom. And if you notice the way that all the water molecules are positioned around the sodium ion, it's all with the water, with the oxygens. So remember, when we're looking at the structure of water, that the hydrogens all carry a partially positive charge, and the oxygen, because it's more electronegative, is going to carry a partially negative charge. So we want the partially negative sides of the water molecules to interact with the sodium ion. The next question that we got to ask is, is it possible to induce a dipole moment? And so that's that's what we're going to look at next. So the likelihood of inducing a dipole moment depends on a molecule that doesn't have one. So a nonpolar molecule depends on two things. The charge on the ion. Or the strength of the dipole moment. So what that means is that 
you could you you could potentially use an ion or you could use a polar molecule okay so the likelihood of, in, of inducing a dipole moment on a nonpolar molecule depends on either the charge of the ion or the strength of that dipole moment and the second thing is the polarizability of the atom or molecule All right, so polarizability, what is that? So in other words, what I'm asking when we're talking about polarizability, how easy is it to distort the electron distribution in the atom or the molecule? And it turns out that the larger the number of electrons, so the more diffuse the electron cloud, the greater its polarizability. And when I'm using the term diffuse electron cloud, okay, that means that the electron cloud is, is spread over a, a, an appreciable volume. Okay, so if we want to induce a dipole moment on a nonpolar molecule, those are the things that we got to take a look at. How, you know, what is the charge on the ion or what's the strength of the dipole moment on the polar molecule that we're going to use to induce the nonpolar molecule? The other thing is the polarizability. How easy is it going to be to distribute or uh, disrupt or distort the electrons in the nonpolar molecule? All right, so while nonpolar molecules do not have a dipole moment, we can actually induce one. And so an induced dipole is the separation of positive and negative charges in the atom. Or, and so this is for the nonpolar molecule due to the proximity of an ion uh, or a polar molecule. So think of it this way. This red ball right here represents a nonpolar molecule, okay? And if this red, if this nonpolar molecule gets close to a cation or an anion, it actually flattens out that molecule. So you actually, because this cation is so close to this nonpolar molecule, it ends up inducing a temporary dipole moment in a nonpolar molecule. And so you can do this with a cation or an anion, or you could use a polar molecule and you induce a dipole moment. OK, so when you induce this dipole moment, we call that London dispersion forces. So these inter interactions where we induce a dipole moment on a on a molecule that doesn't ex doesn't have one. OK, this is called London dispersion forces, which are attractive forces that arise as a result of temporary dipoles induced in molecules or atoms. And this was named after a guy named Fritz London who used quantum mechanics to interpret these dipole moments. And what he found was that dispersion forces usually increase with molar mass. So the higher the molar mass, that means more electrons in the molecule, which means a more diffuse electron cloud. The last interaction that we're going to take a look at is hydrogen bonding. In hydrogen bonding, this is a special case of dipole-dipole interactions. That happen between hydrogen. Okay. And you're going to use a hydrogen of one molecule. and either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine from another. Okay, and so usually we indicate a hydrogen bond by a series of, of dashes or a series of hyphens to show that there's an interaction between one molecule to another. So uh, let's say we draw one uh, water molecule. Let's use water for this. And so oxygen is going to have two bonds, two lone pairs. We know that the shape is bent, and that's all good. So what if we have another water molecule that comes into the, into the mix? So we're going to start with the oxygen of the first water molecule. And that sec the next one that comes in is going to be positioned really close to that first one. So 
you've got the oxygen and using that lone pair that's on the oxygen, that's actually going to start attracting a hydrogen. Okay, so so that's how that first one, that first water molecule attracts the second one. Now, if I have another water molecule come in, okay, I'm going to use that extra lone, the other lone pair to attract another water molecule. So it turns out that each water molecule has the ability each to attract two more water molecules because it's got two lone pairs. So you can, so th this interaction, and I'm going to circle this, that's your hydrogen bond. Now hydrogen bonds tend to be the, are the strongest out of the four. And the, the interactions are around 40 kilojoules. So what's actually pretty cool with hydrogen bonds, if you notice like, uh, you know, when the temperatures get really cold and it starts to get to the point where you're freezing, so you've got these interactions, these hydrogen bonds that form and break in the matter of seconds. So they form and break. And as the temperature decreases, the time to form and the time to break actually starts slowing down. So that way, eventually, that the hydrogen bonds, you know, last a little bit longer. And once we get to the point where the water is frozen, those hydrogen bonds, once the water is completely frozen, those hydrogen bonds are formed. They're like, they're pretty much the strength of a normal bond, even though the, the interactions are around 40. I mean, they, they freeze in place, and that's what gives ice its buoyancy. That's what makes ice really strong, okay? And at, at the moment that the water, free, the water warms up, the hydrogen bonds start warming up, breaking and forming, breaking and forming, and then you got the water, the, the molecules moving around and vibrating. Okay, so... So that's hydrogen bonding. Now, the strength of a hydrogen bond is determined by the Coulombic interaction between the lone pair electrons of the electronegative atom and a hydrogen nucleus. So again, you've got that oxygen that's strong, attract, you know, with that's electronegative, that's attracting that hydrogen nucleus. Because again, remember that in that water, the oxygen and hydrogen bond, the electrons are going to be shifting towards that oxygen. So that means that that hydrogen ends up having or having a partial positive charge, and that's what attracts the initial oxygen. That 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 hydrogen contains that potential that partially positive charge. Okay, hydrogen bonding plays a really really important role in nature. Once we start looking at biomolecules, especially nucleic acids, the strength and the 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 incredible strength that the DNA double helix has is due. The shape is really because of hydrogen bondings holding the nucleotide base pairs in place.